Thank you. Morning, how are you? Uh -huh. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Pathuti. I am a youth climate activist from Kenya. I have done a lot of soul searching about what to say here today. I have asked myself over and over what words might move you. And then I realized that making my four minutes count does not rest solely on me. My truth will only land if you have the grace to fully listen. My story will only move you if you can open up your heart. I can urge you to act at the pace and scale necessary, but in the end, your will to act must come from deep within. I need to tell you what is happening in my home country. Right now, as we sit comfortably here in this conference center in Glasgow, over two million of my fellow Kenyans are facing climate-related starvation. In this past year, both of our rainy seasons have failed, and scientists say that it may be another 12 months before the waters return again. Meanwhile, our rivers are running dry. Our harvests are failing. Our storehouses stand empty. Our animals and people are dying. I have seen with my own eyes three young children crying at the side of a dried up river after walking 12 miles with their mother to find water. Please open your hearts. This is not only happening in Kenya. Over the past few months, there have been deadly heat waves and wildfires in Algeria and devastating floods in Uganda and Nigeria. And there is more still to come. By 2025, in just four years' time, half of the world's population will be facing water scarcity. And by the time I'm 50, the climate crisis will have displaced 86 million people in sub-Saharan Africa alone. I would like you to join me in holding a moment of compassionate silence for the billions of people who are not here with us today, whose stories are not being heard, and whose suffering is not being felt. Please, Open your hearts. If you allow yourself to feel it, the heartbreak and the injustice is hard to bear. Sub-Saharan Africans are responsible for just half a percent of historical emissions. The children are responsible for none. But they are bearing the brunt. We are the adults on this earth right now, and it is our responsibility to ensure that the children have food and water. I have been doing what I can. 
Inspired by the great Professor Wangare Mathai, I founded the Green Generation Initiative, a tree-growing initiative that enhances food security for young Kenyans. So far, we have grown 30,000 fruit trees to maturity, providing desperately needed nutrition for thousands of children. Every day we see that when we look after the trees, they look after us. But these trees and the life-saving fruit they bear will not survive on a 2.7 degrees Celsius warmer planet. The decisions you make here will help determine whether the rains will return to our land. The decisions you make here will help determine whether the fruit trees we plant will live or perish. The decisions you make here will help determine whether children will have food and water. I believe in our human capacity to care deeply and to act collectively. I believe in our ability to do what is right if we let ourselves feel it in our hearts. So for these next two weeks, let us feel it in our hearts. The children cannot live on words and empty promises. They are waiting for you to act. Please open your hearts and then act. Thank you. He dedicated his lifetime to highlighting the beauty of the natural world, Sir David Attenborough. Excellencies, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as you spend the next two weeks debating, negotiating, persuading and compromising, as you surely must, it's easy to forget that ultimately the emergency climate comes down to a single number. The concentration of carbon in our atmosphere the measure that greatly determines global temperature. And the changes in that one number is the clearest way to chart our own story, for it defines our relationship with our world. For much of humanity's ancient history, that number bounced wildly between 180 and 300. And so too did global temperatures. It was a brutal and unpredictable world. At times, our ancestors existed only in tiny numbers. But just over 10,000 years ago, that number suddenly stabilized. And with it, Earth's climate. We found ourselves in an unusually benign period with predictable seasons and reliable weather. For the first time, civilization was possible and we wasted no time in taking advantage of that. Everything we've achieved in the last 10,000 years was enabled by the stability during this time. The global temperature has not wavered over this period by more than plus or minus one degree Celsius. Until now. One burning of fossil, our burning of fossil fuels, our destruction of nature, our approach to industry, construction and learning, our releasing carbon into the atmosphere at an unprecedented pace and scale. We are already in trouble. 
The stability we all depend on is breaking. This story is one of inequality as well as instability. His Excellency Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, President of Kenya. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a key priority during Kenya's tenure at the United Nations Security Council is to amplify the voice of Africa and the global south in building a compelling case for the nexus between climate change and security. And this is because we recognize that climate change is escalating and complicating new and old conflicts throughout the world. The evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is irrefutable. All the reports, including the most recent intergovernmental planet, uh, panel on climate change, sounded an alarm bell that the world risks facing a global catastrophe unless leaders shift gear on climate change. We need to urgently implement bold mitigation and adaptation measures to avert the looming crisis. It is the least that we can do to bequeath a peaceful and sustainable planet to future generations. Climate change poses an existential threat to Kenya and to most countries in the African continent. In Kenya, extreme weather events, including floods and droughts, lead to losses of between 3 and 5 percent of our GDP annually. Further, they aggravate food insecurity and trigger divisive intra-community and inter-country competition for resources. Kenya has developed a robust climate change action plan to scale up efforts and to maintain a low carbon development trajectory. The plan includes commitment to restore degraded water towers, accelerate forest restoration, and to increase our tree cover to at least 10% of our land area in order to promote a sustainable blue economy, but also promoting green manufacturing. Indeed, as many of you know, Kenya is a pace setter in the energy sector. We are among the top eight global leaders in geothermal power development and home to the largest wind power project on the African continent. Currently, close to 90% of the electricity used by Kenyans is from renewable energy sources, and we plan to achieve 100% renewable energy by the year 2030. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Kenya is doing her fair share. Let me, however, hasten to add that these are mere baby steps relative to the enormity of the climate change challenge. Kenya came to this meeting with high expectations that COP26 will deliver on at least four critical issues. First, to see an increase in ambition in emissions reduction, the major emitters must make more ambitious their emission reduction commitments. We all must harness low carbon investment opportunities as we reboot our economies. Second, we would like to see a quantum increase in climate finance. Two times in a row, developing countries have been promised US dollars 100 billion per year, but this has yet to be delivered. Today, once again, yet another pledge of 2023. Third, we would like to see ambition on adaptation and loss and damage. With climate impacts increasing, provisions to help the most vulnerable to adapt including through increased financial support, should be strengthened. Finally, we expect that detailed rules and procedures 
for implementing the Paris Agreement will be finalized and a clear way forward for climate resilient pathways set. We also expect that the agreement will be sufficiently inclusive to accommodate the needs and priorities of developing countries and in particular the special needs and circumstances of Africa, which, is put, which has been very ably put forward earlier and very well articulated by Elizabeth Wahote, the young girl who spoke to us earlier. Indeed, the findings of the inter international scientific community, including the recent report of the Integrated Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on the physical science and basis of climate change, underscore the, ne the special needs and circumstances of Africa, contribute to the vulnerability and the low adaptive capacity of African countries to climate change. The IPCC further notes that even with scaled up global climate action, it will not be possible to avoid and to reduce all loss and damage from the impacts of climate change and that by 2030, the economic costs of loss and damage in developing countries is expected to be between US dollars 290 billion and US dollars 580 billion. Throughout Africa, as the most vulnerable continent to the impacts of climate change, countries are already experiencing loss and damage of an increasing magnitude and frequency. We are therefore deeply concerned to hear that yesterday, during the adoption of the agenda for this conference, the item on the special needs and circumstances of Africa was yet again not adopted. And we expect the COP president to undertake extensive and comprehensive consultations and address the special needs and circumstances of African states and indeed report back to us before the close of the session of, this con of the conference. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, our own Kenyan Eliud Kipchoge, the greatest marathoner of all time and our climate champion, and who will be attending this conference, has demonstrated to us that in a race against time, no human is limited. We have the means and the ability to protect our planet from climate change related destruction and to secure peace and stability for all. What we need now is to recognize that we are in a race against time and we need unanimity of purpose. We need boldness and unwavering political commitment to achieve the 1.5 degree pathway. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. But we now find three gaps. On mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees. And with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed. And this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion. And this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%. Not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance 
and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present? What excuse should we give for the failure? In the words of that Caribbean icon, Eddie Grant, will they mourn us on the front line? When will we, as world leaders across the world, address the pressing issues that are truly causing our people angst and worry, whether it is climate or whether it is vaccines? Simply put, when will leaders lead? Our people are watching and our people are taking note. And are we really going to leave Scotland without the resolve and the ambition that is sorely needed to save lives and to save our planet? How many more voices and how many more pictures of people must we see on these screens without being able to move? Or are we so blinded and hardened that we can no longer appreciate the cries of humanity? I have been saying to Barbadians for many years that many hands make light work. Today, we need the correct mix of voices, ambition, and action. Do some leaders in this world believe that they can survive and thrive on their own? Have they not learned from the pandemic? Can there be peace and prosperity if one third of the world literally prospers and the other two thirds of the world live under siege and face calamitous threats to our well-being? What the world needs now, my friends, is that which is within the ambit of less than 200 persons who are willing and prepared to lead. Leaders must not fail those who elect them to lead. And I say to you, there is a sword that can cut down this Gordian knot, and it has been wielded before. The central banks of the wealthiest countries engaged in $25 trillion of quantitative easing in the last 13 years. 25 trillion of that, 9 trillion was in the last 18 months to fight the pandemic. Had we used that 25 trillion to purchase bonds, to finance the energy transition, or the transition of how we eat, or how we move ourselves in transport, we would now today be reaching that 1.5 degrees limit that is so vital to us. I say to you today in Glasgow that an annual increase in the SDRs of $500 billion a year for 20 years put in a trust to finance the transition is the real gap, Secretary General, that we need to close, not the $50 billion being proposed for adaptation. And if $500 billion sounds big to you, guess what? It is just 2% of the 25 trillion. This is the sword we need to wield. Our excitement one hour into this event is far less than it was six months ago leading up to this event. Can we, with those voices and these speeches from Sir David and others, find it within ourselves to get the resolve to bring Glasgow back on track? Or do we leave today believing that it was a failure before it starts. Our world, my friends, stands at a fork in the road, one no less significant than when the United Nations was formed in 1945. But then, the majority of our countries here did not exist. We exist now. The difference is we want to exist 100 years from now. And if our existence is to mean anything, then we must act in the interests of all of our people who are depending on us. And if we don't, we will allow the path of greed and selfishness 
to sow the seeds of our common destruction. The leaders of today, not 2030, not 2050, must make this choice. It is in our hands. And our people and our planet need it more than ever. We can work with who is ready to go because the train is ready to leave. And those who are not yet ready, we need to continue to ring circle and to remind them that their people, not our people, but their citizens, need them to get on board as soon as possible. Code red, code red to the G7 countries. Code red, code red to the G20. Earth to cop, that's what it said. Earth to cop. For those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have a heart to feel, 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda, for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we have come here today to say, try harder, try harder. Because our people, the climate army, the world, the planet, needs our actions now, not next year, not in the next decade. Thank you. Please welcome the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to COP. Welcome to Glasgow and to Scotland, whose most globally famous fictional son is almost certainly a man called James Bond, who generally comes to the climax of his highly lucrative film strapped to a doomsday device, desperately trying to work out which coloured wire to pull to turn it off, while a red digital clock ticks down remorselessly to a detonation that will end human life as we know it. And we are in roughly the same position, my fellow global leaders, as James Bond today. Except that the tragedy is, this is not a movie. And the doomsday device is real. And the clock is ticking to the furious rhythm of hundreds of billions of pistons and turbines and furnaces and engines with which we are pumping carbon into the air faster and faster, record outputs, and quilting the earth in an invisible and suffocating blanket of CO2, raising the temperature of the planet with a speed and an abruptness that is entirely man-made. And we know what the scientists tell us, and we have learned not to ignore them. Two degrees more, and we jeopardise the food supply for hundreds of millions of people as crops wither, locusts swarm. Three degrees, and you can add more wildfires and cyclones, twice as many, five times as many droughts, and 36 times as many heat waves. Four degrees, and we say goodbye to whole cities. Miami, Alexandria, Shanghai, all lost beneath the waves. And the longer we fail to act, the worse it gets, and the higher the price when we are eventually forced by catastrophe to act. Because humanity has long since run down the clock on climate change. It's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock, and we need to act now. If we don't get serious about climate change today, it will be too late for our children to do so tomorrow. I was there with, with many of you in Copenhagen 11 years ago when we acknowledged we had a problem. I was there in Paris six years ago 
when we agreed to net zero and to try to restrain the rise in the temperature of the planet to 1.5 degrees. And all those promises will be nothing but blah, 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 to coin a phrase. And the anger and the impatience of the world will be uncontainable unless we make this COP26 in Glasgow the moment when we get real about climate change. And we can. We can get real on coal, cars, cash and trees. We have the technology to deactivate that ticking doomsday device. Not, not all at once. I'm afraid it's too late for that. But one by one and with ever greater speed and efficiency, we can begin to close down those billions of hydrocarbon combustion chambers that you find currently in every corner of the planet. We can phase out the use of cars with hydrocarbon internal combustion engines by 2035. We can do that. We in the UK are leading by ending new sales by 2030. We can end the use of coal-fired power stations. We can do it by 2040 in the developing world, 2030 in the richer nations. We can plant hundreds of millions of trees, a trillion. It's not technologically difficult. And halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. Not just because it's a spiritually uplifting and beautiful thing to do, but because that is the way to restore the balance of nature and to fix carbon in the air. And as we look at the green industrial revolution that's now needed around the world, we in the developed world must recognize the special responsibility we have to help everybody else to do it. Because it was here in Glasgow 250 years ago that James Watt came up with a machine that was powered by steam, that was produced by burning coal. And yes, my friends, we've brought you to the very place where the doomsday machine began to tick. And even though for 200 years, the industrialized countries were in complete ignorance of the problem that they were creating, we now have a duty to find those funds. $100 billion a year that was promised in Paris by 2020, but which we won't deliver until 2023, to help the rest of the world to move to green technology. But we cannot and will not succeed by government spending alone. We in this room can deploy hundreds of billions, no question. But the market has hundreds of trillions, and the task now is to work together to help our friends to decarbonize using our funds, the funds we have in uh, development assistance, and working with all the multilateral development banks so that in the key countries that need to make progress, we can jointly identify the projects that we can help to de-risk so that the private sector money can come in. In just the same way that it was the private sector that enabled the UK to end our dependence on coal, become the, the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have the technology. We can find the finance, and we must. And the question for us all today is whether we have the will. And my fellow leaders, as I look around this room, I don't want to put too, too find a, a finer point on it. But, you know, we all talk about what we're going to do in 2050 or 2060. I don't think it will escape the, the notice of the crowds of, of young people outside, the billions who are watching around the world, half of the population of the world under 30, that the average age of this conclave of, of world leaders, uh, I'm afraid to say, is over 60. I fully intend to be alive in 2060. I will be a mere 94 years old, even if I'm not still in Downing Street. But you never know. But the children, the children who will judge us are, are, are children not yet born, and their children. And we are now coming centre stage before a vast and uncountable audience of, of posterity, and we mustn't fluff our lines 
or miss our cue, because if we fail, they will not forgive us. They will know that Glasgow was the historic turning point when history failed to turn. They will judge us with bitterness and with a resentment that eclipses any of the climate activists of today. And they will be right. COP26 will not and cannot be the end of the story on climate change. Even if this conference ends with binding global commitments for game-changing real-world action, two weeks from now, smokestacks will still belch in industrial heartlands. Cows will still belch in their pastures, even if some brilliant Kiwi scientists are teaching them how to be more polite. Cars powered by petrol and diesel will still choke congested roads in the world's great cities. No one conference could ever change that. If summits alone solve climate change, then we wouldn't have needed 25 previous COP summits to get where we are today. But while COP 26 will not be the end of climate change, it can and it must mark the beginning of the end. In the years since Paris, the world has slowly and with great effort and pain built a lifeboat for humanity. And now is the time to give that lifeboat a, a mighty shove into the water, like some great liner rolling down the slipways of the Clyde. Take a sextant sighting on 1.5 degrees and set off on a journey to a cleaner, greener future. So let us therefore in the next days devote ourselves to this extraordinary task so that we not only continue with a program that is of, of green industrial revolution that is already creating millions of high wage, high skilled jobs in power uh, and technology, taking our economies forward. Let us also do enough to save our planet and our way of life. And as we work, let us think about those billions of beady eyes that are watching us around the world, increasingly edgy and disenchanted. And let us think of the billions more of the unborn whose anger will be all the greater if we fail. We cannot let them down. We have the ideas, we have the technology, we have the, the bankers, we have the corporations and the, the NGOs, we have the interpreters, we have the meeting rooms, if all else fails, we have the unbeatable hospitality and refreshment of, of Glasgow. We may not feel much like James Bond, not all of us necessarily look like James Bond, but we have the opportunity and we have the duty to make this summit the moment when humanity finally began, and I stress began, to defuse that bomb and to make this the moment when we, be when we began irrefutably to turn the tide and to begin the fight back against climate change. Yes, it's going to be hard, but yes, we can do it. And so let's get to work with all the creativity and imagination and goodwill that we possess. Thank you very much and good luck to all of us. Thank you. Bringing voices from Earth into COP26. Please. You do not need me to tell you that the eyes and hopes of the world are upon you. To act with all dispatch and decisively because time has quite literally run out. The recent IPCC report gave us a clear diagnosis of the scale of the problem. We know what we must do. With a growing global population creating ever-increasing demand on the planet's finite resources, we have to reduce emissions urgently and take action to tackle the carbon already in the atmosphere, including from coal-fired power stations. Putting a value on carbon 
thus making carbon capture solutions more economical, is therefore absolutely critical. Similarly, after billions of years of evolution, nature is our best teacher. In this regard, restoring natural capital, accelerating nature-based solutions, and leveraging the circular bioeconomy will be vital to our efforts. As we tackle this crisis, our efforts cannot be a series of independent initiatives running in parallel. The scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global systems level solution based on radically transforming our current fossil fuel based economy to one that is genuinely renewable and sustainable. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector. With trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. So, how do we do it? First, how do we get the private sector all pulling in the same direction? After nearly two years now of consultation, CEOs have told me that we need to bring together global industries to map out, in very practical terms, what it will take to make the transition. We know from the pandemic that the private sector can speed up timelines dramatically when everyone agrees on the urgency and the direction. So each sector needs a clear strategy to speed up the process of getting innovations to market. Second, who pays and how? We need to align private investment behind, those, behind these industry strategies to help finance the transition efforts, which means building the confidence of investors so that the financial risk is reduced. Crucially, investment is needed to help transition from coal to clean energy. If we can develop a pipeline of many more sustainable and bankable projects at a sufficient scale, it will attract greater investment. Third, which switches do we flick to enable these objectives? More than 300 of the world's leading CEOs and institutional investors have told me that alongside the promises countries have made, their nationally determined contributions, they need clear market signals agreed globally so that they have the confidence to invest without the goalposts suddenly moving. This is the framework I've offered in the Terra Carta Roadmap created by my Sustainable Markets Initiative with nearly 100 specific actions for acceleration. Together, we are working to drive trillions of dollars in support of transition across 10 of the most emitting and polluting industries. They include energy, agriculture, transportation, health systems, and fashion. The reality of today's global supply chains means that industry transition will affect every country and every producer in the world. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the private sector is ready to play its part and to work with governments to find a way forward. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many of your countries I know are already feeling the devastating impact of climate change through ever-increasing droughts, mudslides, floods, hurricanes, cyclones and wildfires, as we've just seen on that terrifying film. Any leader who has had to confront 
such life-threatening challenges knows that the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of prevention. So I can only urge you, as the world's decision makers, to find practical ways of overcoming differences so we can all get down to work together to rescue this precious planet and save the threatened future of our young people. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome the COP26 People's Advocate, who has dedicated the profound questions before us. It's simple. Will we act? Will we do what is necessary? Will we seize the enormous opportunity before us? Or will we, or will we condemn future generations to suffer? This is the decade that will determine the answer, this decade. The science is clear. We only have a brief window left before us to raise our ambitions and to raise to meet the task that's rapidly narrowing. This is a decisive decade in which we have an opportunity to prove ourselves. We can keep the goal of limiting global warming to just 1.5 degrees Celsius within our reach if we come together. If we commit to doing our part of each of our nations with determination and with ambition, that's what COP26 is all about. Glasgow must be the kickoff of a decade, a decade of ambition and innovation to preserve our shared future. Climate change is already ravaging the world. We've heard from many speakers. It's not hypothetical. It's not a hypothetical threat. It's destroying people's lives and livelihoods and doing it every single day. It's costing our nations trillions of dollars. Record heat and drought, fueling more widespread and more intense wildfires in some places and crop failures in others. Record flooding and what used to be a once-in-a-century storms are now happening every few years. In the past few months, the United States has experienced all of this, and every region of the world can tell similar stories. And in an age where this pandemic has made so painfully clear that no nation can wall itself, wall itself off from borderless threats, we know that none of us can escape the worst that's yet to come if we fail to seize this moment. But ladies and gentlemen, within the growing catastrophe, I believe there's an incredible opportunity, not just for the United States, but for all of us. We're standing at an inflection point in world history. We have the ability to invest in ourselves and build an equitable, clean energy future, and in the process, create millions of good paying jobs and opportunities around the world Cleaner air for our children, more bountiful oceans, healthier forests and ecosystems for our planet. We can create an environment that raises the standard of living around the world. And this is a moral imperative, but it's also an economic imperative. If we fuel greater growth, new jobs, better opportunities for all our people, and as we see, current volatility in energy prices, rather than cast it as a reason to back off our clean energy goals, we must view it as a call to action. High energy prices only, only reinforce the urgent need to diversify, diversify sources, double down on clean energy development, and adapt promising new clean energy technologies so we can not only oh, oh, we don't remain overly reliant, on one source of power to power our economies and our communities. It's in the self-interest of every single nation. And this is a chance, in my view, to make a generational investment in our economic resilience and in our workers and our communities throughout the world. That's what we're going to do in the United States. My Build Back Better framework will make historic investments in clean energy, the most significant investment to deal with the climate crisis that any advanced nation has made ever. We're going to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by well over a gigaton by 2030. 
while making it more affordable for consumers to save on their own energy bills, with tax credits for things like installing solar panels, weatherizing their homes. Lowering energy prices will also deliver cleaner air and water for our children, electrifying fleets of school buses, increasing credits for electric vehicles, and addressing legacy pollution. It will incentivize clean energy manufacturing, building the solar panels and the wind turbines that are growing energy markets of the future, which will create good-paying union jobs for American workers and something that none of us should lose sight of. When I talk to the American people about climate change, I tell them it's about jobs. It's about workers who will lay thousands of miles of transmission lines of clean, modern, resilient power grid. The auto workers who build the next generation of electric vehicles and electricians who will install a nationwide network of 500,000 vehicle stations to power them throughout my country. The engineers who will design new carbon capture systems and the construction workers who will make them re a reality. The farmers who will not only help fight global hunger but also use the soil to fight climate, climate change. The communities that revitalize themselves around new industries and opportunities. And because we are taking all these actions, the United States will be able to meet the ambitious target I set in the Leaders' Summit in Climate back in April, reducing U.S. emissions by 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. We'll demonstrate to the world the United States is not only back at the table, but hopefully leading by the power of our example. I know it hasn't been the case, and that's why my administration is working overtime to show that our climate commitment is action, not words. On my very first day in office, I took action to return the United States to the Paris Agreement. Since then, our administration has been hard at work on locking clean energy breakthroughs to drive down the cost of technologies that will require us to do to achieve net zero emissions and working with the private sector on the next generation of technologies that will power clean economy of the future. Over the next several days, the United States will be announcing new initiatives to demonstrate our commitment to providing innovative solutions across multiple sectors, from agriculture to oil and gas, to combating deforestation, de deforestation, to tackling hard and to abate industries. We're planning for both short-term sprint to 2030 that will keep 1.5 degrees Celsius in reach and for a marathon that will take us, take us to the finish line and transform the largest economy in the world into a thriving, innovative, equitable and just clean energy engine of net zero for a net zero world. That's why today I'm releasing the U.S. long-term strategy, which presents a vision of achieving the United States' goal of net zero emissions economy-wide by no later than 2050, and reinforces an absolutely critical nature of taking bold action in the decisive decade. We're also going to try to do our part when it comes to helping the rest of the world take action as well. We want to do more to help countries around the world, especially developing countries, accelerate their clean energy transition, address pollution, and ensure the world we all must share a cleaner, safer, healthiest planet. We have an obligation to help. In the United Nations, at the United Nations in September, I announced that my administration is working with the Congress to quadruple our climate finance support for developing countries by 2024 including significant increases in support for adaptation efforts. This commitment is made possible to each of our collective goals of mobilizing $100 billion annually for climate finance, but mobilizing finance at the scale necessary to meet the incredible need is an all-hands-on-deck effort. As other speakers today have mentioned, governments in the private sector and multilateral uh, development banks must also do their work to go from millions to, to billions to trillions, the necessary effect of this transition. Today, I'm also submitting a new adaptation communication laying out how we will implement the global goal of adaptation, as well as announcing our first ever contribution to the Adaptation Fund. But our commitment is about more than just financing. That's a critical piece of it. 
but we're also going to support solutions across the board. In the lead-up to this gathering, the United States joined our G7 partners to launch a Build Back Better World initiative. We also reconvened the major economies forum on energy and climate to launch transformative actions and to raise ambition. And together with the European Union, we're launching a global methane pledge to collectively reduce methane emissions, one of the most potent greenhouse gases, by at least 30 percent by the end of the decade. More than 70 countries have already signed up to support rapid reduction of methane pollution, and I encourage every nation to sign on. It's, it's the simple, most effective strategy we have to slow global warming in the near term. My friends, if we're to recognize that a better, more hopeful future of every nation has to do its part with ambitious targets to keep 1.5 degrees in reach and specific plans of how to get there, especially the major economies, it's imperative that we support developing nations so they can be our partners in this effort. Right now, we're still falling short. There's no more time to hang back or sit in the fence or argue amongst ourselves. This is the challenge of our collective lifetimes, the existential threat, threat to human existence as we know it. And every day we delay, the cost of inaction increases. So let this be the moment that we answer history's call here in Glasgow. Let this be the start of a decade of transformative action that preserves our planet and raises the quality of life for people everywhere. We can do this. We just have to make a choice to do it. So let's get to work. And thank you. Those of us who are responsible for much of the deforestation and all the problems we have so far have an overwhelming obligation to the nations who, in fact, were not there, have not done it. And we have to help much more than we have thus far. God bless you all, and may God save the planet. Thank you.